Hello and welcome to the MVP Squared project from Simon Langton Boys. Every neuron in the central nervous system is partially insulated by a myelin sheath along the conducting axon, and it's mainly made up of proteins and lipids. The most abundant of these proteins is proteolipid protein 1, and the second most abundant is myelin basic protein. Now, under normal circumstances, the myelin sheath is intact and allows for efficient conduction of nerve impulses. However, there are conditions and circumstances where this isn't the case, and one is multiple sclerosis. And this is an autoimmune response where the body, body attacks its own myelin sheath, and it can lead to partial damaging there, or, and in cases where the myelin sheath is completely stripped away. Now, that is an MRI scan there of a patient with MS and their brain, and if you see, if my hand would steady, you see that white patch there. That is a plaque, which is a formation of scar tissue that's built up over time as the body's continually attacked the myelin sheath. And that plaque is also called a sclerosis, and the plural being scleroses. If you have many scleroses, you have multiple sclerosis. Now, there's no clear direct cause for multiple sclerosis, but there are many factors that can give you a predisposition towards it. You can be genetically predisposed. In the islands in the Outer Hebrides, up to one in a hundred people will have MS, and the increased chance of inheriting it is often blamed on Viking genes. Lack of vitamin D is also an important factor because MS is virtually non-existent at the equator, but as you move further north or south, the, south, the incidence generally increases because there's less sunlight and less vitamin D. Exposure to severe viral infections, such as the Epstein-Barr virus, can also cause MS as well. And for some reason, being female is another predis predisposition towards it, as almost three-quarters of young sufferers of MS have... Sorry, of MS are e female. Uh, MS is one of the most common neurological diseases in the UK, and up to 100,000 people are estimated to be suffering from it. The project, MBP Squared, has been running for nine years and is currently in its tenth year and over the course we've received funding from the Wellcome Trust and we've been continually supported by the University of Kent and their staff as well as their equipment. Students at Langton Boys are carrying out original research into MBP and its relation to the development of MS. MBP, unlike a lot of other proteins, has no tertiary structure. It's fragile and held together just by weak hydrogen bonds. That being the case, it's also wide to, subject to a wide range of post-translational modifications, one of the main ones being phosphorylation. The theory is that this phosphorylation changes the structure at, of MBP at certain points, and this causes the body to recognise the myelin basic protein as foreign, and then develop an autoimmune response against it, and that this then causes MS. I will now pass you on to Katerina, who will explain a bit more about the techniques and the processes we've used in the, you didn't, yeah, used in the project. Um, so the first thing that we had to do as part of the project was actually to clone the human gene. Um, then we had to alter it and put it into an expression plasmid, which is essentially a plasmid that will express the desired gene that we want. Um, so we did this using something called a polymerase chain reaction, or PCR reaction. Um, so what we did was we designed sections of single-stranded DNA called primers, and we sat, sat them at either end of the gene, and they have intended cut sites which add eight histidine amino acids to the tail end or C-terminal end of the axon. Um, so the histidine amino acids, keep that in mind because that is important. Um, oh, wrong way. Yeah, there we go. So um, this is our expression plasmid. So the green is a gal promoter, which means that we can express the gene in galactose. Um, the pink strip up the top is our modified MBP. And this is called a shuttle vector. So it means that we can use it in both E. coli and yeast. Um, so as I said, the histidine amino acids are important because this is now how we separate our MBP from our yeast proteins. Um, so what we do is we use nickel sepharase chromatography. So we have a column, as you can see, and we run our proteins through this and nickel binds with histidine. So we are then able to have our MBP stuck to the column and hopefully wash everything else away. And what we can then do is wash away what's stuck to the column and hopefully we've separated our MBP. So Sam, hopefully, is now going to tell you about how we actually identify this as MBP. 
Well, the main way that we identify MBP is using SDS page gels. And the, uh, these are this is essentially a process that allows us to separate our proteins by molecular weight. Um, along the sides of the SDS page, you can see there is our ladder to compare against. And then in the, in the, of these three, um, these, these three signals at the bottom here on the left, we have our wild type MBP. In the middle, we have our modified MBP. And on the right, we have our bovine MBP. And it turns out our MBP is actually more pure than the bovine MBP, which is always nice. And then, to be or in order to make sure that we then actually have our MBP, we use Western blotting. And we transfer our proteins from our SDS page gel onto a membrane. We then block this membrane so that our antibodies, which we then add, will then only bind to their target protein. We then flood the membrane with our primary antibody, shown by the orange or green um, Y-shaped protein there, which will then only bind to the MBP, shown by the red protein. We then wash the membrane, and then we add our secondary antibody. And attached to this secondary antibody is an enzyme. So then we add the substrate to this enzyme, 2-chloronaprol. Um, the enzyme substrate reaction occurs, and we see a black precipitate, as shown on some of our results here. The first panel is our SDS page gel that I showed you earlier. The middle panel is when we use the primary antibody that will then only bind to the MBP. And you can see strong signals from the wild time MBP, our MBP, and the bovine MBP. So we have been successful in purifying the MBP. The third panel on the right, you can see a weak signal for the wild time MBP, a strong signal for the bovine MBP, and then no signal in the middle where our MBP should be. This is not a mistake. This is simply because we used a primary antibody that will only bind to MBP if it has been phosphorylated on amino acid threonine at position 98. And we used a technique known as site-directed mutagenesis in order to change threonine to alanine. And because alanine can't be phosphorylated, we don't get a signal. And then... And you can see here, here is um, two layers of the myelin sheath which wrap around each other with the good metaphor being a Swiss roll. And between these layers, you can see the hairpin-shaped protein MBP, um, which holds the layers together and acts like a glue. Um, 3 and 98 the amino acid, is roughly on the curved section of the MBP protein. So when phosphorylation occurs here and the protein structure begins to fall apart, you can see how then the structure of the myelin sheath will become to fall apart, the layers will fall apart, and demyelination will occur. Another protein found within the myelin sheath, proteolipid protein 1, or PLP1, with that being the most abundant protein found in the myelin sheath, interacts with MBP within the protein, within the myelin sheath, sorry. And we are, the next step is to look at this protein, PLP1, and see if we can develop a binding assay, binding assay to test different chemicals and see if we can strengthen this interaction between the two proteins because by strengthen this, strengthening this interaction we lower the, um, lower the chance of demyelination occurring and therefore multiple sclerosis being diagnosed. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hello. Hello, that's better. Uh, thank you very much. Just before I open to questions, um, can you just expand a little bit on one of those last points? Give me a little bit of context about what you think the applications could be in the future or how this could help with MS. Um, so at the moment, while there's loads of research into multiple sclerosis, no one really knows the exact cause. So the aim is sort of, if we're looking at you know, how these um, proteins interact and look, what's going on, we can maybe eventually pin down a cure um, well, we can pin down a cause, and then we can hopefully look at better treatments than there are at the moment, which would be a really great thing for lots of people with multiple sclerosis. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much. All right. Who's got a question? Come on. That's better, isn't it? Um, anyone else? Because we've heard from both of you two. I'd love to hear from you again. Oh, oh there you go. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, as you correctly say, um, MS is an autoimmune disease. Um, do you have any hypothesis to how the immune system becomes involved with MBP, possibly? So the, current th so the current theory is that when the MBP is phosphorylated and the body begins recognizing it as foreign, is that antibodies cross the blood-brain barrier and actually attack the myelin sheath, which causes demyelination. And that is the extent of my knowledge at this time. So. 
Students, any questions from students? Come on, just even what it was like, what the process was like, their research, come on, it differs from yours, so must be think something you want to know. You don't need to nail into the nitty gritty. Nice one. So you were talking earlier, it's a nine year process. Is it difficult picking up previous work from students and continuing with it, or is it quite easy to just get into the study straight away? Great question. And how do you feel kind of picking up that baton, I guess, and taking it forward? Um, well, when, I, when we started the process, kind of at the beginning of the year 12, because there's been nine years of research, it was kind of a bit much to take in at once. But then Dr. Colthurst was very good at kind of easing us into it slowly and making sure that we then get a full understanding of the project that way. And being able to understand it that way was a, it's a really great thing to be able to do because going into university or into a scientific field, it allows us to already have knowledge in some basic laboratory techniques and also some of the fields that we'll go into working into. Nice one. Thanks. Thanks for the question. All right, one more at the back. Uh, hi, what barriers did you come across in your research? So a lot of the time, one of the problems is that the yeast doesn't actually transform or the E. coli just won't take up at the plasmid. Equally, another issue is that sometimes the antibiotic selectable marker we're using, so in the case of E. coli, we're using ampicillin, sometimes the uh, antibiotic goes out of date and it takes a while for you to realize that, and you have to buy some new ones because your cultures have been, the controls are all working really well, and you're getting loads of bacterial lawns, but it's not, it shouldn't be that many. So that's one of the barriers, really, missing things when you should really see them. But. It's always good when you ask that question and somebody chuckles, and you go, oh boy, do I want to tell you this? Um, great stuff. Give them a huge round of applause. Thank you very much.